I welcome all of you to our November Ethics Roundtable. So it is my pleasure to introduce Colin McAllister. And Colin is an assistant professor in the Department of Visual and Performing Arts at the University of Colorado and Colorado Springs. And he's also a 2021 Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Fellow. Already did a, a student event on ethics in, in music. And he is one of those people that can have great ideas that are, he says, cross-disciplinary ideas. So even if you're not in the music realm, you're going to find a lot of things that, that ideas that he has that you might be able to apply. And one of the things I think about music when, when I think about ethics is this notion of, of how music can help us remember some of these ethic things as well, because uh, it, it, I don't know if you remember Schoolhouse Rock, you know, I've always thought, you know, jingles and, and using music to, to help us realize that uh, we can be ethical and still uh, enjoy the arts, okay? So, so uh, we're going to hear from Colin and I'm very pleased to let him take over. Hi, Colin. Hey, Tracy, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be with you all, well, virtually today. It's always, I always appreciate more to be in person, but I, I really am happy to see all of you taking the time out of your Friday afternoon to hang out with me. Tracy did mention that uh, it could be best for me to go first because then I can get feedback from the rest of you before I actually implement my plan. So that was part of the strategy of going first is that I can lay out some of these things I'm planning to do with my fellowship this year and, and hopefully get some feedback from some of you if you have some ideas. So uh, I'd like to start today with a personal anecdote. I'm a great lover of bookstores particularly used bookstores. And my wife will tell you in general that I hate shopping, which is true. The idea of going to the mall at Christmas time or going to the grocery store or God forbid going to Target, those are kind of anathema to me. But I actually really can spend hours in bookstores. And um, I went to graduate school in San Diego and there are two really fantastic used bookstores in San Diego. One is Sadly, closed now. It's called the Adams Avenue Bookstore. And then another one called D.G. Wills in La Jolla. And I discovered both of these stores in the late 1990s when, when I uh, entered grad school at UC San Diego. And those stores, the thing that was really neat about them is they had a really scholarly selection of books that appealed to me. It wasn't the kind of general titles that you'd find at Barnes & Noble or one of these places, but things that you might find in a big library in the, you know, in the music section or something like that. <clears throat> and so I love both of these bookstores and particularly the Adams Avenue bookstore. They had, uh, it was sort of an old house style of building almost that had all these little intricate rooms and they had a, a whole room upstairs, maybe the size of a walk-in closet that was dedicated to classical literature. And my brother had read classics at university and got me interested in Roman history and in maybe learning Latin or learning Greek and that kind of thing. So they had this whole room that was only books in Latin and Greek. And needless to say, there was usually no one else in there except for me when I was there. And some of the books that they had were these Oxford classical texts. These are books published by Oxford University Press. They're generally considered to be the most reliable editions of the ancient Greek and Latin authors that English and American scholars use, certainly. And they're pretty bare bones. There's no illustrations. The titles and even the introduction to the book is always in Latin. There's no explanatory notes about the text you're reading, just the Greek text itself and an apparatus criticus at the bottom of the page that talks about manuscript variants and so forth. And one recent writer even described these Oxford classical texts as having a ferocious severity to them. And I was looking through these Oxford classical texts and I came across 
Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, which is one of two extant treatises that survives from Aristotle. In it, he explores the idea and asks the question of what is the chief or primary good for humankind? So I thought, well, this is kind of an interesting book. You know, it's a little expensive. But I opened it up, and out from the middle of the book fell this piece of kind of folded up, yellowed onion skin paper. And I opened up that syllabus. Well, I opened up the thing, and it turned out to be a syllabus for a class on Aristotle that was taught at Harvard University in the winter of 1942. And whichever student had owned that book had folded up that syllabus and put it inside. And, you know, I ended up, I said, I, boy, I really want this syllabus. I don't care so much about the book. But then I looked at the title of the book and said, you know, if you want that syllabus, I think you need to buy the book that goes with it. And it's a treatise on ethics, right? So as an impoverished graduate student, I forked up the $20 or whatever that they wanted for this edition of Aristotle. And certainly all of us from time to time reflect on the moral dimensions of our lives, what sorts of persons we ought to be, which goals are worth pursuing, how we should relate to others. And it's natural that we may wonder about the answers to these questions that have been provided by the most profound thinkers of past generations. And so my initial uh, purchase of this volume led me to take an interest in ethics. It actually led me to try my hand at studying ancient Greek, which continues two decades today after numerous failures. Uh, I'm taking an uh, independent study with Mary France, who's a retired classics professor here at UCCS. I'm actually missing that right now to be with you all to talk about ethics. So um, 20 years of haphazard ancient Greek study, I still love it. Uh, it led me to read Plato and Cicero and Augustine of Hippo and Thomas Aquinas, um, great thinkers during the Enlightenment on ethics, like Immanuel Kant and David Hume, and then later Friedrich Nietzsche, who wrote widely about the subject in the late 19th century, and modern day authors, even uh, like Jean Paul Sartre or Celia Wolf Divine or Peter Singer. And so I had this thought that, well, maybe my the idea of a fellowship for the Daniels Ethics Foundation has been in waiting for a long time. And so I'm really very privileged to be a part of this. Um, Kevin Landis, my wonderful colleague from theater and dance, whose office is just down the hall from mine, initially got me interested in this DFEI fellowship. He was a fellow, I think, two years ago and, uh, you know, got me to come to some of the meetings because he said, well, there's a great lunch there. So, you know, that was obviously a big motivation for it. Um, but I must admit, I was a little uncertain and nervous about doing a, a project uh, with the Daniels Foundation, because of course it's centered in the College of Business, right? And I thought, well, business folks obviously know a lot about ethical things. It's quite easy for them to talk about stuff like compliance and regulations. In fact, Tracy's talk last month was centered around this idea of uh, essential skills for ethics and compliance professionals. And so I thought, well, despite my personal interest and in reflection upon ethics, how would I translate this in an interesting way to my discipline as an artist? Now, of course, I see uh, you know, Kevin Laudner's here. I suppose if his guitar was habitually out of tune or if he always played with poor posture, I could cite him for something akin to non-compliance in the guitar playing world. Um, but, you know, the more I, I looked at the, uh, at the DFEI principles and goals, the more reasonable it seemed to me. After all, one of our stated goals is to create the next generation of ethical business leaders, right? That's what it says on our website. And I, the more I reflect, I think, well, artists and especially musicians, we are active in our communities and we are leaders. Most musicians have teaching as some part of their professional practice. And so we have to be there to be role models for our students uh, who can range, you know, ages three to, to 83 or more, uh, where we are in the public eye all the time in the realm of public performance. Um, and we uplift and inspire 
I mean, I think of the absence of live performance that we all suffered during COVID. It's actually still kind of going on. And how many people just said to me, wow, this is, I feel like this is something I've appreciated so much and it's been taken away. So um, Tracy asked me specifically if I would share some music with you all. And so I wanted to show you a little video of something that I did do during COVID. This was through an organization I work with, a nonprofit called the Twisted Spruce Music Foundation. And we produced over a period of a few months, a virtual guitar orchestra. We got over 100 guitarists from across the world to record parts that we sent to them of a, of a newly commissioned piece, and then we put them all together. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, but also the other thing I want to do, as all of you probably know, Zoom is great for talking to others, but it's not really great for listening to music from other folks' computers. So I'm going to put the YouTube link in the chat window. I just did that now. And so if you would like to, I don't know how to do this, but if you want to turn my computer sound off and then just go to this YouTube link and listen to it directly, it will sound better. But let me go ahead and share this. So I'm going to play it from my computer. If you listen to it from yours, we'll just come back uh, in four minutes or whatever this is. Okay, Tracy, you see my screen? It says parts together. Everybody see that? All right. I'm going to go ahead and play this now. Uh, 100 Guitar Orchestra.
So if anybody's thinking of putting together a hundred guitar orchestra and then trying to sync video and hiring an animator and getting it all colored and stuff, don't. It's not a good business idea. It took us an unbelievable amount of hours, but it it, it turned out really cool. And, and thank you, Delaney. Um, so, um, so you know, going back to the to the Daniel's ethics idea, the more I looked at the principles, in particular, integrity, trust, accountability, transparency, respect. I thought, well, as a musician, I use all of those every day, and I rely on all those every day to do what I do as a musician. And so with Kevin's encouragement and Tracy's encouragement, I wrote a, a proposal and was accepted to this fellowship program. One of the, uh, you know, I'm a very good follower of directions, Tracy, and one of the directions on this guidelines here was to give a brief introduction to our discipline. And so I want to uh, you know, the music industry as a whole is massive, but at least I can talk a little bit about what I do and have done um, to give you an idea of, of, of our discipline. Of course, life for me as a UCCS professor is now is a little different. I started here at UCCS in 2012, and now I do all kinds of things that I had never done before, like serve on committees and uh, I was on the architectural design committee for this new Ent Center and, and all kinds of fun things. But for a good portion of my uh, young adulthood and uh, middle age, young adult years, uh, I was basically a gun for hire, a freelance guitarist and conductor. So I pretty much made all my living from activities relating to being a guitarist. Um, and being a professional performer, I think it's a lot like combining the discipline of an athletic pursuit with creative thinking. Now, it also doesn't normally pay as much as pro sports. So, Tracy, I ask, where were you and your fancy business colleagues when I was choosing a career 30 plus years ago? Uh, I made my living on a string of performances, mostly throughout the U.S. Uh, I played in about 40 different states, but also quite a bit in Mexico and an occasional European trip. And some of the things that I've had an opportunity to do as a player uh, or as a conductor in my life have been very exciting. I've played at Red Rocks, I've played at Fiddler's Green, I've been able to do concerto with an orchestra, which is very fun. Uh, a great early gig I had in my career, I lived at the Broadmoor Hotel for two months and played a Christmas show there, and I could eat in any restaurant I wanted and sign the bill, that was pretty cool. Um, I was a headliner at a Bethlehem Music Festival on the East Coast, I got to do a tour of Hungary and Slovakia with a traditional jazz festival. I played at a festival in the Netherlands where you really couldn't sleep because there was an after hours party at the hotel bar until 5 a.m. every morning. And it was filled with loud jazz and smoke. And so basically in your room, you felt like you were in the bar. Um, I did a solo concert in Fairbanks, Alaska, and I have a picture of myself standing outside the sign. This was in early February, and the sign says minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, luckily, I didn't have to play outside, but that was cool to experience some of those temperatures. Some of the gigs that I did uh, were not super exciting. You know, all musicians have some, some bad stories. Uh, I can think of a few. The wedding where the brother of the bride thought he was Frank Sinatra reborn, and we kind of had to haul him off the stage. Uh, I played one time at a festival in Breckenridge in July that was outdoors, and it started snowing on us. Um, I did uh, this really strange gig one time where I got this call. I had this agent in San Diego and he called me up one time and he said, there's this car dealership that is doing some kind of promotion and they want you to come and play flamenco guitar for this promotion. So I said, no problem. So I wore a black kind of flamenco-y looking costume and I had my guitar with me and I went down there and, and they said, yep, uh, we want you to set up over here. So I set up and kind of outside and it was me and then there was I think like a sword swallower or something and like a juggler and then there was somebody dressed up in some kind of a, like a like a dinosaur suit and we were all standing there and so he said all right here's what's going to happen we're filming this big guitar a uh, uh, big car commercial and Jimmy is going to pull the car in front and when he pulls the car, like as he's driving the car in front, you all do your thing and then you stop and then he'll talk about the car for 20 seconds or whatever, right? That it's this 
2012 Dodge Caravan that only has 8,000 miles or whatever. And so he said, okay, that's strange, but that seems fine. So they started to pull the full, the, the car up and I started to play and the guy came over and he said, no, 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 you, you can't play because then we won't be able to hear Jimmy talk about the car. So we just want you to pretend that you're playing. So for two hours, I pretended that I was playing while the, the dinosaur was there and then the sword swallower over here. <laughs> and, then, and then at the end, he said, all right, I got a great idea for the end of the commercial. We want all of you to get into this van and then the van will pull up and you'll have to jump out of it. So I, you know, I was in there with the dinosaur and the sword swallower. And at the end, we had to jump out of the van. Um, so <laughs> it was a kind of a strange gig. Um, another one that was really bad was when I was in my uh, mid-20s, I used to tour around with this violin player. And now this will be a, a throwback for some of you, but Believe it or not, we actually would sell CDs. We made our money from selling CDs, you know, these, these relics from the past. And so he got this idea, he said, we can make a killing selling CDs at the mall during Christmas. And so for 20 days prior to Christmas, we went to all these different malls and sat up in the food court and played like all day long from nine in the morning till 10 at night or something. It was awful. And we were, in, so I got home to, to visit my parents for Christmas and my brother was making fun of me because my pants wouldn't fit anymore. And I said, well, I've been eating mall food for three weeks. Um, so yeah, some, some good gigs, some, some bad gigs in there. Um, I spent a lot of time obviously behind the guitar, I tried to calculate it. I think probably around 30,000 hours at this point in my life, I've spent playing guitar, um, a lot of uh, making recordings, preparing recordings, selling recordings, booking tours, generating marketing materials, doing radio and TV appearances in different cities where we, we, we've been. Um, and yes, I have been on the Mexican whoa, whoa radio, if you're wondering. Um, uh, curating uh, royalty income. There's something called performing rights societies. ASCAP and BMI are two of the biggest ones, and they track performances of recordings that happen. And you get royalties from those if if your recording is played on the radio somewhere, or if it's done, you know, as part of some oh, uh, you know, hold music online. You get you get royalties from those. And I did. Uh, I've done some video instructional series. In fact. Um, business colleagues. I think, you know, one my, my only real financial success was doing this thing for the great courses. I did a beginning guitar course for them and a follow-up guitar course for them. And uh, it's really cool. Millions of people have seen these and it was their best selling course when it came out in 2017. So um, that, that was a, a smart move. I've done a lot of other things that have been a lot of time invested for not much money, but that, that was a good one. Um, and, uh, so I wanted to share then one more, one of the, uh, recording projects that I did recently with a local band here called the Hennessy Six is, um, to, let's see, let me put in the chat. I'm going to do the same thing. So this is a Dropbox link, um, because this is a recording that you can't find online, but this is, uh, original, this is a six piece jazz sextet. It's guitar, uh, tenor saxophone, trumpet, piano, bass, drums with orchestra. So uh, I thought I'd let you listen to this. It's about 10 minutes long. Again, I'm going to play it from my computer. But if you want to go directly to that Dropbox link, the sound quality might be a little better. So let's go here. Try this again. And I'm gonna try playing. This is a, the title track called The Road Less Traveled.
Okay, sorry to have to cut that off there, but in the interest of time, I wanted to just give you a, a, little, a little taste of that. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, turning now to, to my pedagogical plan for 21-22 and how I'm looking to implement the DFEI principles and mission, uh, as Tracy mentioned in her introduction, I started the, the academic year by doing a first Friday talk to all of our music majors. We all, all the music majors as well as faculty get together once a month. And I was inspired by the personal ethics principles that were presented to all of us at our orientation this year by Kent Noble, who's the Bill Daniels Chair of Business Ethics. And he made this, uh, I loved his presentation, he made this great point that all companies have laid out guidelines regarding ethics. And as I reminded my students, if you suffer from insomnia, just go read policy eight on the CU Regents website, which is entitled conduct of members of the university community, specifically section 8A on principles of ethics behavior, of ethical behavior. And so if companies have them, he said, why not individuals? Why we, shouldn't we all do that? And if you remember, Kent led us through an exercise to create these six principles and make them personal so that, that we each would have an emotional investment in them. And I co had a great correspondence with Kent. He was very enthusiastic about me using some of his materials. And I led the students through these exercises. Um, and as part of it, I created my own ethics principles, which I'm happy to share with you later if you like. Uh, I thought that was a really useful exercise, and, and I'm actually uh, bringing that to some of my other classes as well. And, and then with the students, I discussed some of the aspects I plan to incorporate into my classes throughout this year, and I'd like to share some of those with you now. I think perhaps one of the easiest ones to to take on is uh, next semester, I'm teaching a music business and entrepreneurship class. This is a course that I designed and first taught here at UCCS in 2013. And it addresses a wide range of things, um, you know, industry specific topics, things like advertising and publicity, booking and contracts with artists, social media, audio and video production, financial tax and legal issues that are specifically germane to music. But also I work with the students to develop, uh, you know, crucial soft skills, things like developing empathy, improving both oral and written communication, self-management, uh, uh, analytical and logistical problem solving. And I ask students to work to clearly and critically define their individual artistic and professional trajectories in both the short and the long term um, to, to help them establish individuality, to promote entrepreneurial thinking and creative enterprise. And uh, so I asked them to interview potential role models to evaluate their own talents and ambition and to do some kind of a final project as part of that as well. One of the things we always talk about is personal branding. And I think that personal branding as a, as, a, as a musical figure overlaps with your personal branding of who you are every day and how you represent yourself musically and otherwise. And I think the idea of the personal ethics principles really will help students to construct this. Um, I, I always talk with my students in my classes about this idea of curation, curating yourself, creating your artistic career. And I think if we, when we think of a curator, we think of maybe a museum curator, right? Someone who, who gathers a lot of artwork and presents it in a cohesive way. In fact, Karen Larkin, who's one of my uh, Daniel's ethics colleagues, uh, fellows this year, she actually teaches in this minor we have in visual and performing arts in muse, museum studies and gallery practice. But the word curate comes from the Latin verb curare, which means to care for, to be solicitous for, to look or attend to, or to trouble one's self about. And so this idea of curation is very important for musicians as we embark on our careers, because we all do these vastly different things, even if we come out of the same background. We do talk a lot about intellectual property in the business uh, on entrepreneurship class. Uh, we all know that ideas and concepts are not protectable in and of themselves, but that legal protection does extend to the tangible expression of ideas and concepts. 
Um, so we have patents, we have trademarks, we have trade secrets, and we also have copyright law. And copyright protects original works of authorship that are fixed in some kind of tangible medium of expression, whether it's written down, whether it's on a, a, a notation software program, whether it's recorded. And we have lots of examples of these, literary works, musical works, dramatic works, choreographed works, motion pictures, other audiovisual works like sound recordings, even architectural works. And there are a whole suite of rights that extend to copyright protection, the right to reproduce the work, to prepare derivative copies, um, to perform it publicly, to display it publicly. And of course, these rights can easily be infringed, purposely or not, and there's a fine line between some of these things, and there can be big repercussions if one infringes on this law. A lot of music making that has happened in recent years, and particularly with our students, is this idea that involves sampling. So, you know, can you sample, can you take a certain amount from a tune that was written in the 80s and then bring that in and to create your own new piece? Well, there's guidelines about doing that. And so in the, in the class, we talk about how can we stay out of trouble? What's the best practice? And certainly the Daniel's ethics principles uh, are really at the forefront of that. Um, we talk about taxes. I'm not going to talk to a bunch of my business colleagues here about taxes, right? That's dangerous territory. But for instance, many of my students are completely unfamiliar with the idea of what a Schedule C is. And as musicians, we often have significant professional expenses, including our, our instruments and their upkeep, insurance on our instruments, uh, buying materials to perform with, to teach with, subscriptions and dues to different societies. Uh, we hire contractors to perform with us, right? Uh, we do professional training. And so we do talk a lot about what kinds of deductions that are, are permissible and which are not. And again, the idea is, of course, doing things that are per permissible and within the purview of the law and ethical, taking the full advantage of that, but not crossing a line about that. And that's uh, so much of that is about personal responsibility and per personal ethics principles. So that's one project. The second one, um, I think we'll take a little more unpacking, but it's one that I'm really excited about. And it's actually the one that I proposed in my ethics fellowship application. So uh, as I've explained to many of you, I've done a lot of different musical things over my career, but one of the things that's been the most meaningful to me has been focusing on commissioning and performing a new piece by a living composer. I'm talking kind of in the, in the classical world. So uh, asking for someone to write you a piece and then you have this responsibility of doing the first performance. And in the fast-paced world of contemporary music performance, um, both performers and composers establish and advance their careers through some of these premieres of music, especially if they're at major venues or festivals. And a lot of this contemporary classical music that we perform is challenging and it's very time consuming to learn. Um, but the composers are dependent upon we performers to deliver accurate, thoughtful, and well-prepared interpretations. Otherwise, their musical vision cannot properly be conveyed. And in the professional world, I've unfortunately witnessed occasions where a composer's work was denigrated by an audience, not maybe because the composition itself had anything wrong with it, but because the performer's preparation was inadequate. And I, I think that we as performers of contemporary music have this immense responsibility to our craft, because in the case of a well-known work in the classical music realm, say uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, right? If you go to see the Philharmonic play Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, most reasonably educated audience who will have an idea if there's egregious mistakes that are being made, right? Um, the orchestra drops out, the, it's out of tune, um, the wrong rhythms are played, they leave out one movement. Most folks know that. And those kinds of things are just not tolerated 
in a professional setting. But my question is, what about a premier performance um, where no one has actually heard the work except for the performer and maybe the composer in his or her mind? And who's responsible for, for acting ethically? What is the responsibility of that performer for relating to, for doing that piece properly? And the UCCS music program here is really this laboratory, laboratory setting for collaboration between student composers and performers. We're about equally divided in our majors between composers and performers. And my colleagues and I, as, as teachers, we oversee numerous projects each year. And so I'm going to be working with my composition colleague, John Forshee here in his composition seminar, bringing performers in, working on new pieces and bringing in some of these Daniel's ethics principles uh, to engage the students with these principles throughout the process of commissioning and preparing a new work for performance. And I hope through this activity that they'll come to understand that there really are these ethical principles that are at the heart of the matter. Um, so we're gonna be involving a number of courses. I already mentioned the composition seminar. It's a two semester sequence that all of the composers have to take. The entire private lesson curriculum, we offer private lessons in, in just about every instrument and uh, we have many, many students that are enrolled in that every semester. It's kind of at the heart of their curriculum. And we have lots of ensembles, these collaborations between performers and composers in jazz, in classical music, and other areas. And so some of the essential questions that I want to ask students are related to these principles for integrity. You know, as a performer, are you acting with integrity during the rehearsal and performance prog process? Are you bringing your full capabilities to bear every time you bring a work to the stage, even if the composer is not present to call out inadequate preparation, right? If I'm premiering a piece by a composer who's on the East Coast and the premiere performance happens to be in Los Angeles, he or she might not be able to come. So there's no one that's going to be there to tell me whether or not I've acted ethically, right? Um, trust. How does the performer uh, curate, again, a reputation for trustworthiness in the professional community? Do you have a reputation where composers know that you as a performer will always be prepared for every performance of a new work? Accountability. How does the performer inculcate an inner sense of accountability to the composer and to the music? Transparency. What is uh, the composer's and performer's responsibilities to communicate their own shortcomings or limitations in the process. And clearly, obviously respect. Mutual respect is essential to develop healthy and long lasting relationships. Professional music is very, uh, is very unforgiving. There's a lot of competition. There's a high level expected and people can, can really torpedo their careers by a lack of, of any of these things that happen. And so in addition to modeling this in the classroom, um, I, I'm going to bring in some guest composers with whom I've worked recently, uh, colleagues in, in Canada, um, in the U.S., in Cuba, to talk about that process. Um, one of the things that got me started with this is that I was doing a, a festival in Miami, and a well-known composer there actually said something to me. I didn't solicit the comment, but he said, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's good to work with you because I know that you're if I write something for you, you're going to do it right. You're, you're going to spend the time that it takes to do it properly. Um, and I think uh, the, the pedagogical emphasis will extend outside of UCCS. I'm a founding member and sit on the board of directors for the Twisted Spruce Music Foundation. I mentioned this group earlier. We actually have a summer guitar and composition symposium. And I'm going to do uh, an ethics presentation for that symposium next summer because it's all about collaborative work between performers and composers. Um, I'm going to bring in some other educational institutions. We have very good relationships with Pikes Peak Community College, with Colorado College, with the Colorado Springs Conservatory, um, and uh, also with regional arts organizations, uh, 
both the chamber orchestra of the Springs does new works and also the Colorado Springs Philharmonic. And I'm the regular guitarist for both of those groups. And we'll be bringing some of them into the conversation as well to, to work with these students. Um, gosh, we're, we're, uh, we're getting low on time here. I think that might be a good place for me to kind of wrap up my summary of what I'm, what I'm planning to do and certainly solicit some some comments or suggestions for from any of you as to how I might be able to even improve this project and I'm getting let's see oh Tracy has a let's see oh I'm, I'm just getting over to the chat here sorry let's see Tracy says are you able to share how rule of law and respect for property regarding music impact student and faculty use of music yes the Ethics in Action video contest has had to make a requirement that music must not be licensed since in the past. Yeah, um, and yes, yeah, please un please do unmute. Um, yes, there's a huge uh, copyright issue that exists with you know, all of our teaching materials. We all know that. Um, but uh, one of the things that this really points to is this idea of that Sometimes it's, it's safer to not even get into that realm and generate your own materials, right? And this is, Tracy was talking about students doing some jingles for these ethics principles. I'm definitely going to suggest that to my composition colleagues, because then that's something that we can actually use. And one of the things that's interesting is, um, you know, I, I, I really ran into this when I did these great courses projects that I talked to you all about. They, you know, I came in with, it was a challenging project because I came in with this idea that, okay, as musicians, as guitarists in specific, we, we get motivated really to play guitar because we look up to some famous guitarist, right? As a 10-year-old kid, you hear Van Halen play or, or uh, you know, great classical guitarists. But they said, well, nope, you can't use anybody's music for anything. It's too expensive. It's way too expensive. I said, well, you mean, I, can I teach them the first few bars of Dust in the Wind? No, you can't. So I had to do, I had to write all my own pieces that were inspired by famous guitar. So it was fine for me to say, I've written a piece that's inspired by Eddie Van Halen, but of course I couldn't use any of his music as well. So yeah, I think, um, and uh, fair use, laws and the idea certainly of public domain right it, it takes a long time for something to enter the public domain i think right now it's life of the author plus 70 years so eddie van halen just died what last year or two years ago you got another 70 years before uh, 70 years minimum before we, you could use a piece of his in the public domain so yeah great great question i think tracy and i think um certainly <clears throat> as creators we can help with that. What else? I don't, since it's a virtual thing, I didn't really prepare much of, a, of an interactive activity, but, but I'm very happy to take questions. Looks like we've got about five minutes left. Yeah, I, this is Bruce here. Um, hey, Bruce. I have a, have a question. And um, so you, you mentioned reading Aristotle. So it, that reminded me of Aristotle's point that is, is uh, hard to take. When I first heard it, I, it was kind of, I just rebelled against it. And that is part of ethical action is how you feel about the action. If you, it, it, uh, someone gave me the example. And so I, my question is, you know, if you, if a performer goes in and performs a piece of music and then uh, I know that this is tough, you know, the personal element, but, and doesn't have the proper affect that's consistent with the composer's intention or what would be good for the audience you know I, all kinds of questions come up how does a musician develop the proper feel um to to present the music um it, it, and is that a, is that an ethical issue I, that's a question that's a great question thank you for that i think it yeah i think it speaks to ethics and to professionalism both and i think that Yes, so part of, part of learning a piece of music, especially if it's a newer work, we don't have time to go into this, but if it's something that's non-tonal, 
if it's not something that has a singable melody or that you can stomp your foot to it, that can be in a way alienating for audiences at first blush. And so I think that really there's this idea that as performers, we have to create some kind of subtext to the piece that we're relying on, something that's inside of us that's unspoken, but it's some kind of inner story or inner motivation or inner affect, to, to use your word. And I think that that helps to, to bring the piece across. So I think that there's much more of, a, of an ethical responsibility to engage in that kind of thought process, as opposed to if you're going to cover a well-known piece, where it's a little easier for the audience to, to just know, right, they'll either get it right away, or if you do a bad version of it, they won't get it, but they'll know that you do, did a bad version of it. So I think, yeah, specifically these kinds of pieces that are new demand more of a professional and an ethical engagement. Did, did, that, did that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, I guess that it, and you mind a follow-up um, mm -hmm. question. So then, you know, so would a, would a professional then uh, taking a piece of music that had this new, you know, new context, I mean, what if uh, you're a very good musician, but you, you just can't come to grips with a piece of music and emotional, it maybe isn't quite the right, right word, but you, you can't let that music really live through you, whatever's holding you back, you know. You mm -hmm. don't like it. I don't, I think it's beyond not liking it. Because you're a professional, you should be able to remove yourself aside. But would you then, I mean, have you said, no, I, I'm not able to bring the best to that piece, to anyone that wanted you to play something? Yeah, I think so. I try to be selective in what I do. And so if someone sends me something, I'll take it and I'll work on it a bit on my own. And I'll think about my own. A lot of it has to do with the timeline. You know, I say, all right, you want me to do this in three months. I know I can only reasonably devote X amount of hours to this. And I just can't, I can't do it. Um, and, but yes, there have been times where I've gotten a piece and, you know, usually, usually it's people that I work with are people that I know. It's pretty rare that it's someone that I don't know that sends me a piece and says, hey, will you play this at X and X Festival or whatever. Um, but yeah, certainly with colleagues that I've known, I've we've gone back to the drawing board sometimes. And I think that's a lot about this idea of promoting collaboration because for 200 years almost since the time of Beethoven there's been this idea really that that uh, what the composer writes is almost like scripture you can't mess with it you know because there's this you're supposed to communicate the composer's intention but I love the collaborative process and I've never been afraid to go back to somebody and said hey I just I'm playing what you wrote but it doesn't I it can't make sense of it or I don't think I can sell it convincingly. Um, and usually in my experience, composers are very willing to say, okay, that's fine. Let's, let's fix that. What, what do we need to do? So that, that, that's been mostly my experience. And usually then it turns out much better. Thank you. That's good. Which is Thank the you. goal of ethics, right? Yeah. I mean, and, one and, of the and, goals you know, of we, ethics were for things to pursue the good. So that's, yes. that's good. Yeah. Thank yes, you. absolutely. And as a performer, if I commission a composer, I almost always will, I'll have a discussion with, with that person first and say, here's, you know, I have this idea in my mind of a piece sort of based on this. And I wonder if you share that idea. And if this is something we, we could work on together, if that's something you would like to take and go with. And sometimes people tell me, no, like I've been into apocalyptic literature lately. I do all this stuff in apocalypticism and I've approached some folks and said, Hey, would you be interested in doing something related to this? And they say, no. Uh, not really. And that's, it's fine. It's great. I'd rather not have them. But then I have some that have said yes, and it's turned out to be a very valuable collaboration. So, so as I've, as I've gotten older, I've been much more proactive in speaking up in advance to composers as well to say, look at my background, look what I've played. Here's my literary interests. Here's my artistic interests. Here's my social interests. What can we do? Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, thank you.
Good interaction. Okay. Well, right, Stephanie, that. thank you for your comment. Stephanie had yeah. to go to another meeting, but she said it was very interesting. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, and we are out of time. So I, I would like to thank everyone for uh, attending. And as, as we uh, leave today, to think about ways that, that we can integrate the principles in, in our classes as well. But, but also this, this notion about the music industry, all of these ideas that Colin has introduced uh, have implications for uh, other disciplines, the use of music, the use of, of recordings, uh, if we're, you know, contracting with, with a musician, there's all these things to think about. And so I, I thank you very much. I am going to um, allow, you know, further discussion afterwards as well. I apologize that we weren't able to meet in person, but the virtual does allow us to uh, at least um, um, enjoy and and. With that, um, thank you very much. And thank you, Colin. Thank you, Tracy. Surf and turf next time. <laughs>